African History Network and on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. We have a jam-packed show for you uh, today as well. Call in numbers 313-778-7600, 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. All right. So I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday, and we talked about the passing of Bell Hooks, author and activist. Uh, Bell Hooks, we got the news, passed away uh, this past week. Acclaimed author and activist, uh, African American female professor, um, feminist as well. So she wrote uh, under the pen name Bell Hooks after her great great grandmother, after her great grandmother, I should say. She was born Gloria Jean Watkins, September 25th, 1952. Uh, we talked to Dr. Imani Perry on uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered about uh, Bell Hooks. So I'm going to share that segment also. And then uh, we got the news uh, yesterday that legendary hip hop artist and member of uh, UTFO, the Kango Kid, passed away at age 55. So we all remember the 1984 song, uh, Roxanne, Roxanne. And there were a whole lot of uh, answer records and things like this to it. But uh, the Kango Kid passed away age 55. Uh, so we'll talk uh, a little bit about that as well. Uh, passed away from colon cancer. We'll talk a little bit about that also. Uh, and then I I'm going to follow up on some topics we talked about earlier in the week as well. So um, on our Wednesday show and Thursday show, uh, I dealt with the topic, uh, Senator Raphael Warnock. Senator Raphael Warnock, well, first of all, the fight for voting rights intensified this week. There was a seismic shift uh, dealing with the fight for voting rights. And we saw Build Back Better being pushed on the back burner uh, this week. And there were two significant meetings that uh, took place this week, one on Wednesday, uh, you had uh, leaders of uh, the major civil rights organizations that had a meeting with uh, some senator, uh, some senators, Democratic senators who were uh, against changing the filibuster in the Senate. And that meeting was organized by Michigan Senator Gary Peters. Then you had a meeting on Thursday. It was a virtual meeting on Thursday. And that meeting uh, was uh, President Joe Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, and you had some uh, key senators who are also against changing the filibuster. Senator Joe Manchin was one of them. Senator John Tester uh, was another uh, another one. So uh, there has been uh, movement that took place in the right direction this week when it comes to voting rights. Also, we saw that uh, Biden said, uh, basically voting rights is the uh, number one issue now, okay? That was before Senator Joe Manchin went on Fox News uh, today saying he can vote, vote for Build Back Better. Now, many people are saying now, uh, many Democrats in the Senate and the House is not over, and I don't, I don't think it's over either. You come back and you uh, keep fighting and keep putting the pressure on uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, Senator Kristen Sinema, Senator Joe Manchin, but also there's there needs to be an uprising of protests among people in West Virginia putting pressure on Joe Manchin, and there needs to be um, there also needs to be. Uh, pressure put on corporations who came out in July of 2021 in support of voting rights, but now they're silent. But now they're silent. Okay. So we're going to talk about that. And, and I, I, I talked about this some on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday, December 17th. But we're going to, we're going to deal with that uh, 
we're going to talk about that some more today. All right. But Senator Raphael Warnock uh, really came out on Wednesday. And what he did was he talked about bipartisanship and he talked about uh, bipartisanship at whose expense. When we talk, uh, talk about being bipartisan, he said he's for bipartisanship, but bipartisanship at whose expense? OK, and he and, and um, what he was saying, what uh, Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia was saying is that if we can change the filibuster to raise the debt limit, OK, which just happened this past week, if we can change it for uh, and we talked about this early in the week, you had 14 Republicans the previous week that voted to uh allow democrats to be able to pass uh raising the debt limit with only 51 votes so what senator Raphael warnock said is that if we can change the filibuster or get around the filibuster to save the economy why can't we do the same thing to save the democracy and so his speech on the Senate floor went viral. That's the same day that you had a big meeting with uh, civil rights groups and some key Democratic senators. Coming out of that meeting, Senator John Hickenlooper of Colorado that you don't really hear a whole lot about. Senator John Hickenlooper of, of Colorado said we have to change the filibuster. When he was against doing it previously. Senator Maggie Hassan went on the Rachel Maddow show on Thursday after coming out of one of those meetings and said, we have to change the filibuster when she was against the Senate. Senator Maggie Hassan, who does not do a lot of cable news. Most people don't know who she is. Can't pick her up. Can't pick her out of a lineup. She said Thursday on the Rachel Maddow show, she said, we have to change the filibuster. So the pressure has to continue. The pressure has to intensify. And this is why I was saying months ago, um, we need to keep the pressure up on the corporations who, who've come out now saying they support voting rights and things like this. They've all gone silent. OK, they, 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 they've gone silent. So I said on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday, I said either they all went out of business since July and I didn't know they, that I didn't know they went out of business. OK. Or they have amnesia and laryngitis. Now, this was a this was a big article here from uh, NBC News. And this is about Senator Raphael Warnock. Senator sees debt limit increase as model to pass voting legislation. Senator sees debt limit increase as model to pass voting legislation. Discontent is simmering among some Democrats that voting legislation has stalled because of Republican opposition. And this is, they're talking about Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia. Okay, I'm gonna let you hear what he said uh, on the Senate floor as well. One of the key things that he said was that um, slavery was bipartisan. Jim Crow segregation was bipartisan. So he said, when you talk about bipartisanship, he said, I have to ask the question, um, uh, bipartisanship at whose expense? Who foots the bill for bipartisanship? I totally agree. So we'll discuss that. And then Kim Potter. Now everybody saw this. this is now you, so you know the uh, officer Kimberly Potter who shot and killed Dante right now. You know I said she's going to break down crying on the witness stand. OK, I thought she was going to say, Jesus, take me now. She did everything except Jesus, take me now. OK, um, but it, I, I really thought she was going to say, Jesus, take me now. But she came out looking like a soccer mom. All right. Came out looking homely, looking like a soccer mom. Think Not that soccer moms look homely. OK, but <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying <laughs> she looked like a homely soccer mom. There's some fine soccer moms. She didn't look like one. But anyway, just stay with me. OK, so. <laughs> All right. So I knew she was going to break down crying on the witness stand. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to let you hear some of what happened. All right. 
Um, and they're trying to get one juror, at least one juror, that they can find who will go along with um, that. Because see, what the defense is trying to do is they're trying to create a backdoor defense. Because if you watch the video, the body camera video of one of the officers that was on the scene, she clearly said that she made a mistake. She didn't mean to shoot him. She didn't say anything about self-defense. She didn't say anything about, oh, I shot him because I feared for your life. The other, the other officer on the scene with it. She didn't say anything like that. They're trying to create a backdoor defense for her after the fact to say, oh, she was justified in using deadly force because they were afraid that the other officer that was going to be dragged by the car. That's, that's not what she said on the scene. She said, I'm going to prison. She said, I shot the kid. She said, oh, I, you know, I grabbed the, I, I, I fired the gun. She says she didn't know that she shot Dante Wright until he told her that you shot me. So all this happened on the witness stand on a Friday. So the defense is rested. Prosecution already rested. Defense is rested. Uh, and Monday, the jury is going to get uh, instructions and they'll deliberate now. So we'll deal with that. And then uh, President Joe Biden was uh speaking in south carolina at, at a college for commemoration and he talked about his commitment to voting rights as i said before we we have to hold all of them accountable this is what a lot of people don't understand the election is the end of one process and the beginning of a much longer process to hold elected officials accountable and continue to push your agenda and continue to put pressure on people. We'll deal with this on the other side of the break. And we'll also talk about Claudette Colvin, um, who was arrested nine months before Rosa Parks and her record has been cleared for assaulting a police officer. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, stand by, stand by. I got to get ready for this next segment. I'm running behind schedule. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcasting on social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in. Who still needs to register for the online courses I teach on Saturdays and Sundays? As soon as you register, you can start watching the content. From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. We had a great class Saturday. And then ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We're going to teach, I'm going to do this class Tuesday, December 21st at 7 p.m. It's a 10 week online course. As soon as you register, you can uh, watch the uh, classes we've, the previous classes, and you can join us in class live. I'm going to post a link here. We have it on sale uh, $70. It's regularly $130 each class. We have a special bundle pack when you can register for both classes for only seventy dollars. As soon as you register, you can start watching the content. Stand by. Let me post this information here. Okay, stand by. Share this broadcast on social media platforms. It's been a busy weekend. I was recording a commercial for a client also, so that took longer than it should have stand by i just grabbed this out my drawer and threw this on <laughs> okay Stand by. We come back. We'll talk about bell hooks. Back from breaking two minutes.
Okay, I'll be at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History also um, for the Kwanzaa celebrations, fourth day of Kwanzaa and the sixth and seventh day of Kwanzaa. We'll give you more information on that. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, December 19th, 2021, and we are live. Call in numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. All right. Yeah, I was on Facebook earlier today, and I follow Morris Day and the time on Facebook. And I just punched in the number here on the thread of the broadcast call and I almost punched in 777-9311, right? <laughs> the, <laughs> I almost did that. But no, the calling number is 313-778-76. Okay, millennials don't know what the hell that means. Okay, that's a song, right? From the early 80s, Morris Day in the Time. Okay, that was a band coming out of Minneapolis. They were, you know, with Prince, it, it, the, Morris Day in the Time. Okay. Uh <laughs> Some of these things you have to explain. But anyway, uh, I just sent you clip number one, uh, Jalen. We're going to go to that. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We'll count it forever. Um, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent. We focus on a number of different topics, history, current events, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter, text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, so we, we, we got the... Um, we got the sad news um, earlier this week um, that uh, Bell Hooks, uh, I mean, a few days ago, that Bell Hooks passed away. And uh, she was 69 years old. Uh, author, uh, one of her most famous books is Ain't I a Woman? Uh, Black Women uh, Black Women and Fe Feminism. And we talked about this with Dr. Imani Perry on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday, December 17th. Uh, let's go to clip uh, one, Jalen. A couple of days ago, acclaimed author and uh, feminist uh, Bell Hooks passed away at the age of 69. Of course, her real name is Gloria Jean Watkins. She took her name uh, as uh, intestine, uh not to her uh, grandmother. She, of course, focused on topics about feminism and race. She won a number of awards, including the Writer's Award from Lila Wallace, Reader's Digest Fund, was named one of the nation's leading public intellectuals for the Atlantic Monthly, also was inducted into the Kentucky Writers Hall of Fame. Uh, joining me now is Dr. Imani Perry. She's a professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. I'm very glad to have you uh, on the show. Uh, for folks who don't know about Bell Hooks, uh, who don't know about uh, her writing, why was she so impactful, especially to uh, a whole generation, two generations uh, of black women? Many of them were commenting, uh, just shocked and stunned at the passing of Bell Hooks. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, let me say thank you for having me and thank you for spending the time to talk about her. She was an incredibly brilliant woman, um, an author of literally dozens of books. She resonated with people because she 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 wrote from the position that she began. She was a, a country woman. She was from Kentucky and she became an extraordinary intellectual. And through those experiences, decided to share with people how she thought about gender, how she thought about sexuality, how she thought about class, how she thought about injustice broadly. Um, her writing was inviting. It wasn't, you know, um, distant academic language. She, she reached for people where they are, where they were. Um, and she also, and this is really important, I think, for our communities in particular, she wrote about love. And she wrote about spirituality. And so she really thought that the work of the intellectual was to tend to the entire person and to the entire community. And when we talk about, um, again, when I saw the reaction from so many mm -hmm. people, they just talked about uh, the power of her writing and how she centered uh, a black feminism. Uh, that's yeah. something that uh, it wasn't an afterthought. It, w it was the center of, yeah. of everything she wrote about. Yes. I mean, black women were at the center of her calling. She took the name of her great grandmother and and put the name in lowercase 
to, to <laughs> emphasize, she was interested in we, us collectively, our people, our community, black women's legacies in particular, but she didn't, for her, that was an entry point to thinking about the entire world. So for her, black, being a black woman wasn't limiting. It was actually a perspective from which one could understand the world in extraordinary ways. Um, but you always, when you opened her book, you knew that you were being seen, that you were being recognized, and that you were important as a black woman reader. But she, but I also think it's really important to say she also, she loved black men dearly, and she talked about wanting to tend and care for black men as well. I'm bringing my panel, Michael M. Hotel. I want to start with you, your thoughts on Bill Hooks, and also you have a question for Dr. Imani Perry. All right, thanks, uh, Roland. Thanks, uh, Dr. Imani Perry, for coming on today and teaching us more about uh, Bill Hooks. Uh, yeah, this is a big loss as well. She wrote 40 books, books translated into 15 different languages. Uh, I posted about uh, her death on the African History Network uh, fan page. The question I had... Um, Dr. Monty Perry, I know you're the person to ask this too. When we deal with and hear about feminism or black mm -hmm. feminism, oftentimes it, it, African-American men are automatically off put by it. And this has caused uh, factions in the movement for uh, issues pertaining to African-Americans. How do we uh, continue to push for uh, issues that are beneficial to African Americans, while at the same time not denouncing African American women when they talk about issues that are specifically that specifically impact them. Oftentimes, right. when they bring up issues that impact them, they uh, they're told that they're being divisive, and you should just focus on black issues, not black women issues. How do we move forward together? Well, that's a hard, right, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, I think Gloria and I called it Gloria instead of Bell Hooks. I mean, when she wrote the book Feminism for Everybody, she was trying to respond to that. Um, I think, you know, my perspective is I think black liberation is for all black people. And so one of the ways so so we shouldn't think of our, our interests as competing, but we should think every sector of our community deserves to be tended to. Um, and that there is no hierarchy in our communities, that we all deserve care. I mean, if any, if there is one, it is our babies come first, right? And so, um, you know, so that's the ethos. I, I, I understand there are a lot of um, sort of tensions that we, we are complex people. We have differing politics. We have different perspectives. We're not going to all agree. We're not going to have the same idea about liberation. But I do think if we start from the perspective that we care about all members of our community, that that helps. Okay, thank you. Faraji? Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't hear you. Faraji, we can't hear you. Okay, gotcha. Dr. Perry, okay let it go. So let much. it go. That's why. You can Joining go ahead us on the show today. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, in terms of um, Bell Hook's legacy, you know, what would she say to black men today? about getting involved in the feminist movement or what role should black men play in the feminist movement? Because right. I'm, and I'm, I'm sure that you, you've heard this. It seems like there's a generation of black men, younger black men that have very different views about the role of women, the role of men, um, whether it's in the household, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in the community. So, so how would Bell Hooks advise us to move forward on making sure that the next generation of black men are, you know, is a part of the change to bring about a greater level of respect for black women? Well, I mean, I think, and, and I, feel, I feel pretty confident saying this because, you know, I, I spoke to her um, over the last several years and everybody, you know, changes and grows, but it, I think consistently what, what she tried to talk about was being aware of the very particular kinds of oppressions that all folks in our community experience. So you, it's hard to, um, you know, ask people to join a movement without also recognizing what they're experiencing, right? How they might. So I think for young black men in the ways that young black men are targeted and demonized, right? That has to, that's also part of the struggle for liberation. And she was very attentive to that. So it's not a sort of, you know, bring you into one side. It's actually bring us all into recognizing each other. Now, that mm. said, she didn't shy away from challenging sexist attitudes and ideas. Um, 
in ways that not everybody liked all the time, that in ways that people found difficult. But this is why I mentioned the point about love, right? So if love is the, is the underlying ethic to everything that you do and people know that you love them, that makes it a lot easier to accept pushback, criticism, when you know that it's not coming from a place of competition or hostility, but love. And so, you know, this is, it's, but it's, an, it's a long struggle. You know, we've had a hard, hard history. So it's not ever going to be easy, but it's worth fighting for. And that's the lesson she taught us. It's, it's worth fighting for. Thank you. Matt Manning. Good evening, Dr. Perry. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, for teaching us. Uh, my question is just, it's pretty simple. How do we connect Ms. Hook's teachings to this uh, social moment that we find ourselves in, kind of this inflection point as we're fighting for justice? Uh, please, if you would, edify us on how we yeah. can, can use her teachings to kind of move forward at this, this point. Well, I would say, I think, you know, I do think that, that reading um, is, you know, I, I love Ida B. Wells' quote, that people must know before they can act. I think reading is a, should be a ritual practice for all of us. Okay, we're going to pause it right there. When we come back, uh, we're going to hear the rest of that clip. As Dr. Imani Perry, I was on the panel on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday, December 17th. And Dr. Imani Perry was um, talking about uh, the passing of Bell Hooks. She passed away Wednesday, December 15th, author and activist Bell Hooks. We'll continue this on the other side of the break. We'll talk about the Kango Kid. Uh, we'll deal with uh, Kim Potter breaking down crime on the witness stand. I thought she was going to say, take me Jesus now, but she didn't. Uh, in the killing of Dante Wright, and uh, we'll talk uh, about voting rights as well and intensify in the intensification uh, in the push for voting rights that took place this week also. You listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by. Back from break in four minutes. Share this broadcasting on social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. Stand by. Back from breaking four minutes. Okay, I gotta get ready for this next segment. We gotta do, we're gonna do, um, okay, we're gonna do Kango Kid. That was Warnock. And the show goes by quickly. Oh, this is it. This is the one I want right here. This clip right here. That's a Warnock. Stand by, back from break in two minutes. Who still needs to register for the online courses I teach on Saturdays and Sundays? From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And by. What luck. from breaking one minute
It's a network show we do with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. It was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take us out. So you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts. You control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 910 AM Superstation. <laughs> 910, The Superstation, Detroit's only African-American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, The Superstation, The Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, December 19th, 2021, and we are live. All right, I will be at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African-American History uh, for the Kwanzaa celebration that they are celebrating Kwanzaa all seven days uh, this year. I will be there on uh, the fourth day of Kwanzaa. Uh, I'll be there for Ujima uh, on Wednesday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, the, the, now, the African marketplace opens at 4.30 p.m., so I'll be a vendor there. I'll be there Wednesday, December 29th, Charles H. Wright Museum of African-American History. Uh, and then I'll be there on um, Friday, uh, December 31st, New Year's Eve. And I'll be there Saturday, uh, January 1st, New Year's Day. OK, it looks like it's taking place each day, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Visit the right dot org for more information, the right dot org for more information. I'll be a vendor there those three days. That's what I confirmed. That's what I confirmed. That's what I know about. That's the. That's the what i paid for uh if i'm there any additional days i'll let you know as well and we'll have it on our website africanhistorynetwork.com also but i'll have my um uh, uh, my dvd lectures there we will uh, be registering people for my online courses you can come talk to me i'll have a mask on hopefully you'll have one too um <laughs> so <laughs> now this year for their kwanzaa celebration to attend this year to attend the Kwanzaa celebration at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, they're requiring that uh, people either have uh, uh, proof of vaccination or have test have um, tested negative within the last 72 hours. They have the protocol at the website, uh, the right.org, the right.org. And you have to register in advance. According to the website, you have to register in advance to attend the uh kwanzaa celebrations this year but you can also watch it online visit the right.org for more information uh they have the information there okay but kwanzaa is taking place all seven days at the charles h wright museum of african-american history um so if you visit the right.org right on the home page of their website uh they have the information you scroll down and i'm going to pull it up quickly here um you scroll down, it says register to attend Kwanzaa at the right. And then you click right here for register now and follow the steps. OK. All right. And then also uh, today is the birth date of uh, one of the greatest people in um, African-American history. Uh, if you could rank them, I mean. Without this person, we wouldn't have African American History Month. Today is the birth date of one Dr. Carter G. Woodson, born December 19th, 1875. He was born 10 years after slavery ended, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And Dr. Carter G. Woodson uh, not only co founded the uh, Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, September 9th, 1915, but um, he also created Negro History Week as well. He created Negro History Week also. So this is a bad brother. This is, I mean, Dr. Carl G. Woodson is the reason why we have an African-American History Month. It used to be called Negro History Week, then Black History Month. He's the reason why. Okay. So happy birthday to uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson also, known as the father of uh, Black history. All right. So right before the break, um, I w we were talking about bell hooks and the call in number is 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is a call in number if you have a question or comment. I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered on uh, Friday, December 17th. I'm a panelist each Friday on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Most, most of you all know that. And we were speaking with Dr. Imani Perry 
about uh, bell hooks and the legacy of bell hooks. I want to go back to this clip because this uh, uh, on the panel with me was uh, a uh, an attorney, Matt. I forgot Matt's last name. We've been on the panel before. And also for Raji Muhammad, who also does radio out of Baltimore. But I want to go back because Matt was speaking. Let's go back to uh, uh, clip number one, Jalen. You know, I think in the words of Ella Baker, you know, the tribe increases, we carry on. So part of the lesson is to read and learn from her and from many others and then develop our own analyses, right, and try to work together in the now, right? We have this incredible array of ancestors who provide models and who provide insight, but but we are also now, we're here. We're here and we're now we are the ones to continue the work. Um, and understand that it's a, it's lifelong work. We're not going to solve these things, but we can make a significant difference. Okay. All right. Pause it right there. That was one pause it right there. Okay. Um, so you can watch the rest of that uh, on uh, Roland Martin on Facebook, Roland Martin on YouTube. And that's from uh, December 17th. Okay. I want to go to uh, uh, also you can uh, check out the article from NBC News on uh, Bell Hooks uh, passing away and NewsOne.com has a good uh, article also uh, on Bell Hooks. Uh, here's why Bell Hooks use lowercase letters for her name. OK, this is one of the articles uh, that they have from. Uh, news1.com and it dealt with she used lowercase letters for a name to call attention to uh, uh, racism, systemic racism and oppression of African Americans now so let me pull this one up here as well uh, here's why Bell Hooks used lowercase letters for her name this is from uh, news1.com let's try to pull this one up as well Okay, well, um, uh, Black America Web also has the same article uh, uh, as well. So you can check that out there from uh, blackamericaweb.com. Here's why Bell Hooks used lowercase letters for her name. The prolific author who was born Gloria Watkins she passed away uh, Wednesday, December 15th. Uh, she was 69 years old. Cause of death so far has not been uh, uh, given. Uh, social media users quickly reacted to the sad news. Um, some were asking why she, uh, why was that? When I posted the, when I posted the article about her passing, someone posted, um, you know, they should use uh, capital letters for a first and last name. Um, the reasons for Bell Hooks uniquely presented name is twofold. According to the author, professor and cultural critic who was born in Kentucky in the Kentucky uh, town of Hopkinsville on September 25th, 1952, uh, with the name Gloria Jean Watkins. Uh, let's see here. There was a tweet here. Bell Hooks wrote her name in lowercase letters to address systemic injustice and prejudice against black people. She taught us without uh, let me, hold on, let's go on here. Let's go back here. She taught us without fear, uh, gave us the language and courage to speak our blackness in the world, uh, intramural and against white patriarchal uh, heterosexist uh, capitalism. So you can read more here. All right, now I want to go to the second uh, story. So I have been seeing on social media because of some of the people I follow on social media. Um, I, I saw post that hip hop artist, the Kango Kid of UTFO, UTFO and Roxanne, Roxanne fame. I saw he was sick and in the hospital. So I saw different pictures and uh, I follow full force on um, Facebook and um, some people on uh, Instagram. So I saw he was sick 
and people were praying for him. I saw he was sick with cancer. He was in the hospital. Uh, and people were praying for him, but um, he didn't make it. He passed away. Uh, he was 55 years old. Uh, I want to pull up this article here from the New York Times. Okay. And a lot of people remember the song from 1984. Uh, New York Times did a big article, um, uh, full force on their Facebook page posted this piece. So I want to uh, pull this up here. Um, I remember when the, the whole Roxanne battles came out and I, I follow Roxanne Shantae on um, Instagram. Okay. And I, I don't use Instagram a lot, but I started using it more in 2020 because uh, of somebody I know. So, but there's been an outpouring of uh, emotion and love behind uh, the passing of uh, the Kango Kid. And this is another hip hop artist gone too long. So I want to pull this uh, article up here from the New York Times. A Kango Kid dies at 55. Let's see if I pull this up. Kango Kid, early rapper who sought who who sought Roxanne, early rapper who sought Roxanne dies at fifty five. As an early member of the group UT, UTFO, he was heard on one of the most influential and widely imitated songs of commercial hip hop's early years. All right. Um. Okay, so uh, this is a piece. This is a, a piece here from the New York Times. They have a big article on them. Uh, Kango Kid, who as a rapper in the group UTFO, was a key contributor to the 1984 single Roxanne Roxanne, one of the most influential and widely imitated songs of commercial uh, hip hop early years, died on Saturday, December 18th, Saturday morning at a hospital in uh, Manhasset, uh, New York on Long Island. He was 55 years old. Um, his publicist um, said the cause was complications of colon cancer, complications of colon cancer. We'll continue this on the other side of the break. Listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by, back from break in four minutes. Share this broadcasting on social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. Stand by. Back from breaking four minutes. Stand by. Back from breaking two minutes.
Stand by. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, December 19th, 2021, and we are live. I want to remind you, I'll be at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History for the fourth, sixth, and seventh days of Kwanzaa. Uh, I'll be there uh, Wednesday. The, I'll be there um Wednesday, December 29th, and um, I'll be there also uh, Friday, December 31st, New Year's Eve, and Saturday, January 1st, New Year's Day. So the Kwanzaa celebration is taking place, it looks like, each day, um, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Visit theright.org for more information. Now, the African Marketplace, where I will be, because I have a vendor booth there, the African Marketplace uh opens at is open from 4 30 uh p.m to 8 30 p.m okay and you can shop in the african marketplace uh visit the right.org and right on the home page of the website they have information to uh about the kwanzaa celebration and to register for it so this year because of covid they're having uh limited seating and you have to register uh well let me put it like this that you have to register ahead of time and they uh requesting that people either provide proof of vaccination or a negative COVID 19 test within se- uh, taken within 72 hours according to the information i read they have all the information here but you have to register to attend the kwanzaa celebration okay it's free but you have to register to attend so it's a different protocol than normally okay but they're doing kwanzaa all seven days at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Okay, so visit the right.org uh, for more information. And I think you I think you will also be able to watch online as well, okay? Uh, if you can't attend in person. All right. So right before the break, uh, I want to go back to this uh, piece here from the New York Times on... Uh, passing of uh hip-hop artist uh kango kitty passed away 55 years old uh sean schiller fuquare um but stage name the kango kid i remember in 1984 when utfo came out and i was listening to the radio i'm like what is that (laughs) okay (laughs) you know (laughs) I'm like, what is that? (laughs) Right. And then you had all the uh, different songs and et cetera. I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any, been anything like the phenomenon surrounding Roxanne, Roxanne. Um, So the song Roxanne, Roxanne released on select records. Uh, It was the 1984 equivalent of a viral hit. It sold a few hundred thousand copies and went to number 10 on the Billboard R&B singles chart and number 77 on the Hot 100 chart. But its influence was far vaster than statistics could capture. The song was written from the perspective of three men getting shut down by the same woman. Okay, the elusive and imaginary Roxanne. Okay, the woman, the elusive and imaginary Roxanne. Kango Kid opened the song memorably. He said she wouldn't give a guy like me no rap. She was walking down the street, so I said hello. I'm Kango from UTFO. And she said, so. And I said, so. Baby, don't you know I can sing, rap, and dance in just one show? Because I'm Kango, Mr. Mr. Sophisticator. As far as I'm concerned, ain't nobody greater. Okay. And you one of you know, so back in the day, like in hip kangos were big in hip hop. All right. You had LL Cool J wearing kangos, run DMC, but also the Kango Kid. Okay. That's one of the reasons why I wear kangos today. Okay, so <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so Roxanne Roxanne was produced by the group Full Force, 
and I follow them on on Facebook. I saw them post about this article. They said this is the official article about the passing of uh, the Kango kid. So I said, OK, we'll talk about it here on the show. Um, so Roxanne Roxanne was produced by the group Full Force and based on a sample of the big the song the big beat the big beat by the rocker billy squire which the producer howie t t-e-e -E, had brought to the group now it spawned more than two dozen answer tracks i remember i remember listening to all these answer tracks uh back in the 80s and i'm like what is this okay so it spawned more than two dozen answer tracks and retorts many by female rappers most notably the real rock sand okay uh by the real rocks uh, in the, the song the real rock sand was by the real rock sand also produced by full force and roxanne shantae's roxanne's revenge at the height of the roxanne song wars utfo and the real rock sand would share concert bills okay and i it it, it was like okay if there was like social media back in like in 1984 um it's no telling how big it's no telling how big those songs would have been now it was a cultural zeitgeist song that reached across the country when dr dre began working with ice cube he urged him to perform a version of the song at clubs to help generate crowd excitement ice cubes take was called diane diane okay so for those that don't, who just know uh ice cube from barbershop okay ice cube was a rapper back in the day okay so for, for some people that don't know all right <laughs> uh kango kid sometimes called the kango kid was born sean schiller uh Fuquer in brooklyn new york on august 10th 1966 and grew up in the east flatbush neighborhood his father andre was a taxi driver his mother jean was a housekeeper at a hospital kango kid started off as a b-boy or break dancer and he uh he and the neighborhood friend dr ice were known as the keystone dancers the keystone dancers and they toured in the early 1980s uh it, it heard with the early 1980s rap group houdini including the new york city fresh fest and with full force the producers full force they appeared on phil donahue's talk show and were invited to dance at a birthday party for dustin hoffman's daughter now that now that's a name you don't hear every day phil donahue okay because because you remember when oprah winfrey got her talk show like phil donahue was the man and she just like not she just not phil donahue <laughs> out the box right <laughs> phil donahue hung around for a few years but he retired but you, you remember when oprah winfrey came out people can pronounce her name things like this phil donahue was the man she just blew everybody away all right so uh read the rest of this article here dealing with uh the passing of the kango kid from uh new york times kango kid early rapper who sought Roxanne dies at uh 55. He passed away Saturday, uh December 18th. Okay. So our condolences to his family. And you know, we're losing hip hop artists way too soon. Listen to the African History Network show. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by back from break in four minutes. Stand by, I got to get ready for this next segment. If you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Who still needs to register for the online courses I teach on Saturdays and Sundays? Stand by.
Rap from break in three minutes. Stand by. Back from breaking one minute. Detroit, 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, a division of Adele Media. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 9, 10 a.m. Superstation or Adele Media. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, December 19th, 2021, and we are live. Calling in numbers 313-778-7600, 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. Okay, so um, also if you like that type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the ehn show okay we're here uh six days a week this helps us keep doing the research stay on the air keep broadcasting pay some of the bills etc now also um you can and this is our official cash app account dollar sign the ehn show s-h-o-w when you go to it it says michael shows my picture there these other ones here are fake african history network cash app accounts i'm still trying to get them shut down now you can still register for the online courses I teach on Saturdays and Sundays from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. We had a great class yesterday because we dealt with uh, World War II. And uh, we dealt with the rise of Hitler, Hitler becoming a uh, uh, German chancellor in 1933. And um, we, we dealt with uh, World War II and, and uh, some of the aftermath of World War II as well. Uh, as soon as we do the sessions live, all the sessions are archived and recorded you can go back and watch them any time so from the civil war to the civil rights movement in black power 1865 to 1968 normally we do those on saturdays uh about 12 noon to 2 p.m eastern standard time as soon as you register you can watch the class we did yesterday and then on sundays normally sundays i do ancient Kemet, the moors and the maafa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school so these are 10-week online uh classes uh that i teach and understand the transatlantic slave trade we're actually going to uh do that one on uh this week we'll do that on tuesday uh december 21st and we'll do that at uh 7 p uh, that'll be 7 p.m that we do that one okay so when you register for it uh you can watch the previous classes and uh join us in class live all right we'll post a link here now we have a special uh um bundle pack where you can register for both classes for only $70. Normally they are $130 each. And you still have access to the full course even after the 10 week online course is over with. So next year, like Juneteenth or next Christmas, you wanna watch, go back and watch uh, all the classes, you can do that. These make great quality gifts, et cetera. Okay, so visit our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. All right, I wanna go to, um, when, when I was on 
uh, Friday, uh, we know that uh, Kim Potter was on the witness stand in the killing of uh, trial, dealing with the killing of Dante Wright. And we talked about it on uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered. Now, I knew that she was going to break down crying on the witness stand. I knew it. I knew I said, I said it before I said it on this show. She's going to break down crying on the witness. stand. now I thought she was going to say, Jesus, take me now. I thought she was going to have a Bible there or something like that and say, you know, she's saved now or something like that. She didn't go that far, but uh, I want to go to, we're, we're going to, we're going to the next clip. Uh, Jane, I think that's clip three, clip two. And uh, we talked about this on Roland Martin unfiltered. And let's let's go to the clip. Let's see hear what happened. Well, while we are here in Atlanta for the twenty twenty one Cricket Wireless Celebration Bowl between South Carolina State and Bell Hooks that everyone should read. No, the uh, Oh gosh, that's a really hard question when you're talking no, clip, about dozens two, of books. Jay. Um I think it was clip two that I sent is uh, started at the one hour, 13 minute uh, mark. Clip number two it says Kim Potter cries as she testifies. Um, yeah, start at the one hour, about, about one hour, 13 minute mark. OK, so everybody check out this piece here from uh, the New York Times. Kimberly Potter tells testifies that Kimberly Potter breaks down while testifying about a chaotic scene and her missing memory and her missing memory. Okay. So either, either she's suffering from a memory block or she's lying because she doesn't remember what she said right after she shot Dante, right. Or why she said it or things like this, because as I, as I said, at the beginning of the show, right. The defense is trying to create this backdoor defense that she was justified in using fatal force. She did it to save the other officer, things like this, but she didn't say any of that uh, right after she shot Dante Wright. Uh, we got it, we have it queued up. Um, eyes. She was last seen wearing a black sweater and black pants. If anyone knows of DeAndra's whereabouts, please contact the Dallas Police Department Missing Persons Unit at 214-671-4268, 214-671-4268. Uh, today in Minneapolis, uh, the former Brooklyn Center police officer on trial for family shooting Dante Wright took the stand on her behalf. During direct examination, Kimberly Potter told the jury she did not realize she had fired the gun instead of her taser during the April traffic stop until Wright cried out that he had been shot. With Officer Lucky and the driver at the door, um, the driver was trying to get back into the car. Uh, well, he was trying to get back in the car. What did you do? I went around Officer Lucky as they're trying to get back in the door. I'm between the door and Officer Lucky and and the driver. And the driver's getting into the car. And what happened next? And they're still struggling, and I can see Sergeant Johnson and the driver struggling over the, the gear shift because I can see Johnson's hand and then I can see his face. And you, you knew Johnson for many years before this, is that right? Yes. And by looking at his face at that point in time, what did you interpret it to mean? He had a look of fear on his face. And it's nothing I'd seen before. Did you say anything when you saw this? What did you do? We were struggling. We were trying to keep him from driving away. It just, it just went chaotic. I, it, and then I remember yelling, taser, 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 and nothing happened. And then he told me to shut up. 
Can you proceed or you? Yeah. Uh, on Mr. Wright, did you? No. Never saw a gun? No. He never threw a punch? Right. No. Never kicked anyone? No. Never said I'm going to kill you? No. Never said I'm going to shoot you? No. Never said there's a gun in the car and I'm coming after you? No. Okay. It's not uncommon in your experience to find someone who has a warrant during traffic stop, right? That's not uncommon. And you've done hundreds, hundreds of traffic stops in your career, correct? I don't know if hundreds, but yes, I've done plenty of traffic stops. And, and gross misdemeanor offenses are not the same as felony offenses, here? Correct. There's correct. a different order by the judge. Less crime. Serious. Crimes, correct? All crimes are serious, but yes. Well, in terms of the laws of the state of Minnesota that you're duty bound to enforce, a gross misdemeanor is a lesser offense than a felony, correct? Yes. In in court in this case, conversation about uh, the Wright brothers. You made a comment about the Wright brothers joking about not the ones that fly, right? Yes. Um, and then any concerns about whether there was some other Wright family in the area? Sergeant Johnson told you not that family, not this situation, right? I wasn't sure who they were. Okay. Their aid and communicate information to other officers, right? Okay. Yeah. And it's part of your job to assist those who are hurt or injured, true? Yes. Yeah. And to communicate to other officers what you know about a particular scene, right? Yes. Yeah. Give them whatever information you can to help them do their job to help render assistance, things like that, right? Yes. Yeah. But you didn't do any of those things on April 11th, did you? No. You stopped doing your job completely. You didn't communicate what happened over the radio, right? No. You didn't make sure any officers knew what you had just done, right? No. You didn't run down the street and try to save Dante Wright's life, did you? No. You didn't check on the other car that had been hit, did you? No. That all happened just down the road from you. Yes. You were focused on what you had done, because you had just killed somebody. I'm sorry. today and from a reaction on your video, you didn't plan to use deadly force that day, did you? No. You didn't want to use deadly force, did you? The, the objection is overruled. No. No. Because you knew that deadly force was unreasonable and unwarranted in this circumstance. I didn't want to hurt anybody. You didn't want to hurt anybody. <laughs> That's why you said, I'm going to go to prison. I don't. <laughs> All right. The objection is this, Jane. Miss Potter, you know the difference between left and right, don't you? All right, Matt Manning, I want to start with you. I mean, is there a plausible defense? Hey, my bad. Hey, hey, pause it right there, Jayna, for a quick second. Okay, so everybody, so Roland started with Matt Manning. Matt Manning is an attorney. So he started with Matt, and then he goes to me. Let, let's go back to the clip, Jalen. A little bit, to an extent. But I'll, I'll tell you this, let me first say, everything in the courtroom is intentional. Uh, for all your viewers out there, they have her dressed this way purpose mm -hmm. i'm sure her attorneys told her if you get emotional do not stop you know crying um all of those things are unfortunately what lawyers try to leverage in front of a jury and here if you look at the picture they made her look as uh as homely and i mean no disrespect but as homely as maternal as accessible we're talking minnesota right <laughs> so this is all intentional and i say that in support of saying if you notice she didn't even use dante wright's name she continued right. to say right. The driver. I guarantee you, her attorneys want to depersonalize Mr. Wright and make it seem as though 
She's just a good officer doing her job. But I would say here, the tears are for fears. They're to try to impart to the jury the idea that she was so afraid for that a couple things are happening. One, she was afraid for her own safety. But the ancillary thing is that she was afraid for the safety of this other officer. They're trying to establish a defense of third person defense that will essentially say, even if she wrongfully shot him, she's within the bounds of the law because she had a reasonable apprehension that her other officer was going to be hurt. Now, we know that's cockamamie because, in fact, she reached for the wrong weapon, which is absurd if you've had 26 years of training. But in terms of making people think, there is, I think, a chance that at least one juror will, you know, potentially bite that argument. And that's what viewers need to know. In the criminal justice system, a conviction has to be unanimous. So they can get a hung jury off one person buying what we're seeing here, which I think is a, a pretty good acting job. But it's all intentional. That's very important for people to know that I think that's the defense they're going for. They're trying to attack the intentionality, which is why you hear her saying so frequently, I didn't mean to do it. You know, it wasn't purposeful, trying to say it's an accident. OK, we're going to continue this on the other side of the break because you, you get to hear my response next, um, because I was bringing down some things from the case as well. OK, so <laughs> but that was a good legal analysis from uh, attorney Matt Manning. All right, you listen to the African History Network show on Michael and Hotel. Uh, call in numbers 313 778 7600. 313 778 7600. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right, stand by. <laughs> I, I was watching it live. I, I, I watched the trial live on Friday, and I, I'm sitting there. And I'm like, <laughs> because, you know, I'm going through analyzing the case and they're trying to create this backdoor defense that deadly force or lethal force was justified to save the other officer. But when you watch the body cam footage of what happened right after she shot Dante Wright, she didn't say she didn't talk about oh i'm glad i shot him because he was good you know he would drag you down the street and you'll be dead she didn't say i shot him in defense of another officer or i feared for my life or anything that's not what she said she said she said i'm going to prison she said she said i'm going to prison i killed a boy i grabbed the wrong effing gun i shot him that's what she said she all this other stuff they're trying to manufacture on the back end that's not what she said. Stand by. D does I grab the wrong effing gun? I shot him. Does that sound like it was like self-defense or you fear for your life? That's why you shot him? Okay, stand by. Okay, let's see here. Um, we have the information here for the online courses that I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. We had a good class on Saturday, so as soon as you register, you can watch that class. Stand by. Let me see. You know what? We got to zip through this. We had to get to Raphael Warnock. This is coming up on it. I mean, this time goes by quickly. Uh, okay, I'm going to post a link again here. You can register for the classes now. Now, the, this, the other class I teach, we do it thousands of years of history. Ancient Kemet the Moors and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Okay, and um, we do the classes live. All the classes are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. We have a special uh, bundle pack where you can register for both classes for only $70, regularly $130 each. You can also use these with your children as well. I would say they're team. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation and Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. Okay, be, uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Be sure to register for the online courses I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, we had a good class uh, yesterday. 
from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968, because we dealt with World War II and what led up to World War II and uh, how it was connected to World War I as well. And we talked about President, President Roosevelt. We talked about the plight of African-American soldiers uh, during the war uh, also, okay? So we do the ses sessions live. Normally, uh, Saturday and Sunday, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Saturday. It's uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement to Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Each class we go through and analyze approximately a 10-year period of history. Sometimes it could be more. We start in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase, and we look at what leads to the Civil War taking place, which breaks out April 12, 1861 in South Carolina. Uh, and then the other class that I teach on Sundays is Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Kemet won original names for Egypt. Ancient Kemet, the model for understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach them in school. So we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We do that one live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. Our next class for that one is actually going to be Tuesday, December 21st, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So when you register, you can watch the previous classes and you can um, join us in class on Tuesday. So we have a special bundle. You can register for both classes for only $70. That's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, uh, I want to go back to this segment we we're dealing with, uh, the trial of Officer Kim Potter in the uh, killing of Dante Wright. And this segment here, this is uh, from when I was on Roland Martin and filtered on Friday. Uh, check out the article here from the New York Times. They had a good piece on this. Uh, where well, they have key moments in the in the Kimberly Potter trial over Dante Wright's death. They have that one. But also Kim Potter breaks down while testifying about a cha chaotic scene and her missing memory and her missing memory. Uh, let's go back to uh, the clip, uh, Jalen. And even if it isn't an accident, it's OK because I fear for my other officer's safety. That's what you're saying at play here. The issue, the issue here, Faraji, is, oh, I didn't mean to do it, but somebody is dead as a result of her actions. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, that's that's the big issue. But I, I'm wondering, how much does the part of her screaming out, taser, 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 will play into this? I mean, we, and Matt, I think you're making some excellent points, saying from everything, the way she's dressing and, and to the emotion. But, I mean, the part that she says, taser, taser, taser. I can't personally get past that. I I'm wondering if that is going to be a, you know, like the Achilles heel of this case where she's not going to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law because she announced Taser even though she reached for her service re revolver, her service weapon. So I I'm wondering, you spoke about intentionality, the intention behind this whole situation. The intention seems to be a huge part of this whole case because she said taser you can clearly hear it on on the uh on video but then at the same time as the uh prosecutor said that you know you didn't reach out for the other folks you didn't see what happened to dante Wright, you didn't see what happened to the other cars i mean the intention is certainly a big part of this but that one little piece where she says taser 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 i'm thinking that just might be a situation that to, to give her just a little leadway in the in the minds of those jurors. I, I don't know. You know what I mean? I, I, we, we have dealt with, and we've talked about it endlessly on this show, many cases where there have been those small lines, small details that have often been kind of like, oh, you know, disregarded. But in this case, I, it's, it's still hard for me to see that there's going to be justice served for the family of Dante Wright just because she yelled out, Taser, 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 Matt. Brother Roland, am I wrong on this? Well, well, also, it's just so yeah, yeah, Matt, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say really quickly, uh, I think that's a, a great question, but I think the intentionality here is precisely the issue insofar as that's what she's saying. I was trying to reach for my chamber. I didn't have the intent to do this act that actually caused his death is what I'm getting at. So that's, I think, what her defense attorneys are trying to attack uh, because generally, homicide statutes, manslaughter statutes are going to have an intentional element. And that's exactly what they're lobbying for. Not only was this not intentional, 
However, even if it was intentional, she had a defense of third person statute uh, or defense. And the way that works very quickly is generally you're entitled to a defense if there's a scintilla or a very small amount of evidence showing that you should get an instruction in a jury charge, which is why they asked her all those questions about the other officer on the other side of the car. That's what you're seeing them try to establish right now. Mm. All right. Uh, okay. I, I think it's an ad coming up, but let let it play because it should go to the uh, my segment. Uh, also, once again, check out the article here from uh, the New York Times. Now, I, I found it interesting that she had the memory loss. Now, they had a um, psychologist who testified, and the psychologist's name is. Uh, Lawrence Miller, Dr. Lawrence Miller. Dr. Lawrence Miller a, is a Florida psychologist who specializes in the study of police psychology. He testified on behalf of the defense on Friday that action errors, action errors happen to almost everybody, likening, likening it to someone writing the incorrect date on a check. Now, Dr. Lawrence Miller who was specific who has specifically studied the issue of quote unquote weapons confusion weapons confusion among police officers testified that quote an extreme degree of stress can uh can trigger action errors in law enforcement even leading to officers blocking out memories of such incidents in a previous ruling Judge Chu, uh, Judge Chu, who is a the presiding judge, uh, Judge Regina Chu, uh, in a previous ruling, Judge Regina Chu blocked uh, Dr. Lawrence Miller from saying this is what happened in the incident between Kimberly Potter and Dante Wright. Do we have the rest of the clip, Jalen? You can just press play. Okay. Um, All right, let me know what's going on now. Um, so check out check out this piece here once again from the New York Times. Uh, Kimberly Potter breaks down while testifying about chaotic scene and her missing memory, and then they have some other articles here. These are some updates here from the New York Times. Um, let's see, Jalen, are you still there? I want to make sure we're still connected to the radio station. Hold on. Uh, what happened? Oh, okay. Hold on. I got to call back in. We lost our connection to the station. Stand by just a second. I got to call back in. We dropped the call. Yeah. Okay. We I, I didn't realize we dropped the call. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was waiting for you to tell me to pause the clip. <laughs> oh it, well, I, I come up next. I, I, it, it should have been me next in that right. clip. We on had the, your whole piece already. Okay. Do me a favor. Just back it up because uh, people didn't hear it on the social media platforms. Just back it up to when when Roland comes to me if you can. All right. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks. I didn't realize right. we dropped the call. Okay. okay. All right. Stand by, everybody. <laughs> This is this is live radio. So this is what happens when live radio when you're remote because of COVID. Normally we would be in the studio and we wouldn't drop a call because I'll be right there with Jalen. But <laughs> they're out at the radio station studio and I'm broadcasting from from my office. Okay, so we have the click cue back up, Jalen. Yes. Okay, let's go. Let's pre press play. No. That's, I think, what her defense attorneys are trying to attack uh, because generally homicide statutes, manslaughter statutes are going to have an intentional element. And that's exactly what they're lobbying for. Not only was this not intentional, however, even if it was intentional, she had a defense of third person statute uh, or defense. And the way that works very quickly is generally you're entitled to a defense if there's a scintilla or a very small amount of evidence 
showing that you should get an instruction in a jury charge, which is why they asked her all those questions about the other officer on the other side of the car. That's what you're seeing them try to establish right now. Mm. The thing here, uh, Michael, um, that when you watch this, her attorneys have already laid the groundwork by saying, oh, if she's found guilty, they want the judge to sentence her and not the jury. Mm-hmm. But we also right. know in many of these cases, juries give the police officers extreme, I mean, extreme benefit of the doubt. And so it's not mm-hmm. clear cut that she's going to be convicted in this case. No, it's not clear cut. Now, the prosecution did a really good job today. And as I said before on the show last Friday, I knew she was going to break down crying on the witness stand. Uh, they had her dressed like a soccer mom today to uh, uh, to get some sympathy also. But, you know, what's really – it's a number of things that are really damaging. The the body cam footage of, of what happened right after she shot Dante Wright. She said, uh, I'm going – Okay, we're going to continue this on the other side of the break. Uh, you listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by. Okay. So we'll go back to that clip. Then we're going to go to Reverend Raphael Warnock calling out Democrats and Republicans on the Senate floor regarding the filibuster after 14 Republicans voted. 14 Republicans voted to. Uh, Break the filibuster so Democrats could raise the debt limit. And he's saying if you can get around the filibuster for to save the economy, you should do the same thing to save the democracy. We're going to talk about this next. We talked about Claudette Colvin earlier in the week. I don't, uh, and we, we, uh, on my show here, we talked about Claudette Colvin. I think it was Thursday on Thursday show. Um, we dealt with it Friday on Roland Martin Unfiltered as well. We'll probably play that segment on tomorrow's show because we're running out of time here. We started off talking about, uh, passing a bell hooks, and that segment went a little longer than I had anticipated. Stand by. All right, now we have African American History Month is coming up, and we have the um, uh, a 15 DVD bundle pack uh, from me of, of my lectures. If you want this in digital download format, email me and let me know. This is on sale for hundred dollars. It's 15 of my lectures. This is good for Kwanzaa as well. It's a lot of uh, it's a it's a lot of information. I cover a lot of history. We have this on sale for hundred dollars. Is at our website AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll post a link here. You can register for this. So we have this shipping out this week. Fifteen DVD bundle. If you want this in a digital download format, let me know. Uh, okay. So this is on sale a hundred dollars. It's a, um, 15 of my lectures, including, uh, my presentations dealing with the film black Panther, but also one dealing with the, uh, history of African American history month as well. That's at African history network.com. Stand by back from breaking two minutes. Nine ten, the Super Station, the oldest radio station in town since 1922. Welcome back to the After History Network show. I'm your host, Brother Mike Lim Hotep. It is Sunday, December 19th, and we are live. Now, this year uh, for the uh, for Kwanzaa at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, uh, they're doing all seven days of Kwanzaa, and they're doing it in person. Uh, I will be there for uh, Wednesday, December 29th, the fourth day of Kwanzaa Ujima, Wednesday, December 29th. 
And I'll be there for the sixth and seventh days of Kwanzaa, uh, December 31st, New Year's Eve, and uh, Saturday, uh, January 1st, okay? And we have to get used to saying 2022 also. All right, now uh, visit the right.org, W R I G H T, the right.org. They have the information uh, right on the homepage of the website for the Kwanzaa celebration. This year, they are asking people to uh, register in advance for Kwanzaa, to attend Kwanzaa. And they are requiring uh, people to either uh, be able to provide proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test, uh, within the last 72 hours. Uh, they have the information at their website, the right.org. They have a section on Kwanzaa, click, uh, register to attend. They have the information there. And then also, um, uh, the celebrations are best I can tell 7 PM to, uh, they, 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 uh, about 7 PM, uh, start at 7 PM Eastern standard time, uh, each day. And they have more details there. The African marketplace will open at 4 30 PM. Okay. And it's free to attend the Kwanzaa celebrations. I will be, I will be in the African marketplace, uh, uh of the museum. I have my vendor booth there and we'll have our DVD lectures. We'll register people for our online classes as well. You can come talk to me. Um, I'll have a mask on. Hopefully you'll have a mask on as well because this ain't no joke. All right. So right before the break, we were given an update on what took place uh, Friday, December 17th in the uh, Kim Potter trial and the killing of Dante Wright. And we talked about this in Roland Martin and Filtered. I want to go back to that segment. Let's go back to the clip, Jalen. What happened right after she shot Dante Wright? She said, uh, I'm going to prison. She said, I killed a boy. She didn't say anything about fearing for her life. She didn't say anything about trying to protect other officers, anything like that. She said, holy sugar, honey, sugar, honey, iced tea. I just shot him. She said, I grabbed the wrong effing gun. I shot him. OK, but then the, the prosecution today went on to talk about how. So, you know, after Dante Wright was shot, the car drove off. He hits another car uh, when other officers arrive on the scene. Uh, officer Kim Potter didn't tell the other officers exactly what happened and did not try to render aid to Dante Wright either, who was down the street and crashed into another car. So, yeah, this, you know, a lot came out today, and we know the defense uh, rested today as well. So uh, it's not clear-cut that she's going to be convicted, but the prosecution did a good job. I really don't think uh, a lot of her testimony today really helped her. The tears did help, but the well, testimony uh, is different than the tears. Well, uh, well, guess what? Uh, jury, juries can be very emotional in terms of what mm -hmm. they buy. And Matt said, all you need is yep. one to say yep. uh, not guilty. So we'll be following this, okay. following okay. this conclusion. All, all right, pause it right there, Jalen. Pause right there. Okay, now, and something that's come up in the trial is, you know, something else. And uh, if you know your primary colors, um, her her taser is yellow her gun is black so when you look at her own body camera footage and she holds the gun you can see the gun there when she says taser 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 you can see the gun is clearly black and the taser is yellow and the taser is on the left side of her body her gun's on the right side of her body so okay um so we'll see what happens in, in this case here. Now, th this one I'm not as sure of as the Derek Chauvin murder trial because it was overwhelming evidence. This one here, you go 50-50. You got a crying white woman on, on the witness stand. You know, go either way uh, here. I mean, she's guilty, yeah, but you got to convince all 12 jurors of that. So we'll see what happens. Um. I want to go to this next story here because we ran out of time here. Um, Senator Raphael Warren. So the fight for voting rights intensified and went in really into overdrive this week. Um, uh, we talked about this early in the week. Wednesday, Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia uh, blasted Republicans as well as Democrats 
for not uh, changing the filibuster. Okay, number one. And you can read this uh, article here from uh, NBC News. Senator sees debt limit increase as model to pass 14 as model to pass voting legislation all right and this is about senator Raphael warnock um let me pull this up here this one right here this is a really good article then now this is tied to what happened the previous week this article here from cnn is from december 9th 2021 we talked about all this here on the show because all this gossip and nonsense we don't deal with here i do like real research so I knew this was coming. 14 GOP senators broke a filibuster to advance debt limit fast track process. 14 GOP senators broke a filibuster to advance debt limit fast track process. Okay. And so this was the previous week. The Senate voted on Thursday to advance a bill to create a fast track process allowing Democrats to raise the federal debt limit, uh, a crucial next step as lawmakers race the uh, the clock to avert a catastrophic uh, debt default. We, we're going to clip forward, Senator Raphael Warnock, uh, uh, Jalen, just a second here. Now, what happened was 14 Republicans voted so that then democrats with just 51 votes could raise the debt limit because republicans in the 2022 midterm elections then want to turn around and blame democrats for raising the debt limit so this is why they did this to get there the plan supporters needed to break a gop filibuster which required 60 votes to succeed the vote tally was 64 to 36, meaning 14 Senate Republicans crossed the aisle to vote with Democrats who control only 50 seats in the chamber. Now, as I've said before, and some people don't really understand this, a 50-50 Senate, which is a slim majority, a 50-50 Senate is not the same thing as a 60-40 majority Senate. A 50-50 Senate, a slim majority, is not the same thing as a 60-40 decisive uh majority in the senate because most of these bills require 60 votes to pass now they have a list here of the 14 senate republicans who voted you can read this here roy blunt of missouri shelley moore capitol of west virginia who's the other senator from west virginia because west virginia i mean keep in mind donald trump won west virginia in 2016 and 2020 by about 40 points that's basically a red state um senator mitch mcconnell of course voted for it as well so that they can then blame democrats in the in the midterms oh you raised the debt ceiling lisa mikowski of alaska mitt romney of utah so you can read this here Joni ernst of uh, ernst of iowa so read this article here this set up what took place uh this past week with the raising of the debt limit okay now i want to go to um it should be let me see what clip is that clip three yeah clip three from the uh let me see what is that um it's clip two and three clip two and three we're going to we're going to clip two Jalen. let's this is senator Raphael warnock uh on the senate floor here's what he said Senator Raphael Warnock of the great state of Georgia is one of the best orators the United States Senate has seen in a very, very long time. Watch him on this today. Watch. Democrats have tried again and again to engage our Republican friends in a discussion on this issue, one that lies at the foundation of our democracy. And time and time again, because of a lack of good faith engagement, the rules of the Senate have prevented us from moving that conversation forward. We could not imagine. We could not imagine changing the rules. That is until last week. Because last week, we did exactly that. Be very clear, last week, we changed the rules of the Senate. 
to address another important issue, the economy. This is a step, a change in the Senate rules we haven't been willing to take to save our broken democracy, but one that a bipartisan majority of this chamber thought was necessary in order to keep our economy strong. We changed the rules to protect the full faith and credit of the United States government. We've decided we must do it for the economy, but not for the democracy. Madam President, I will be honest. This has been a difficult week for me as I pondered how am I going to vote on this debt ceiling question we're about to take. Okay, pause, pause right there. Uh, we'll continue this on the other side of the break. Just back it up about 20 or 30 seconds, Jalen. We'll continue this on the other side of the break. This is the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right, stand by. Back from breaking four minutes. Man, this two, this, this two hours went by quickly. Show's almost over. Show went by quickly. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Rest of the stuff we have to get to tomorrow. Stand by. Okay, if you like this type of information, also you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Who's joining us in class on Tuesday, 7 p.m.? For ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Okay, back from breaking two minutes. Stand by. How's everybody doing? Abdi, Kenya, Robert, Young, Young Deity. Fly girl. Stand by. Back from breaking one minute. All right, back from breaking one minute. We're on commercial break. Okay, so we have my 15 DVD bundle pack at our website, then with African American History Month. And then uh, we have the online classes that I teach also, Saturdays and Sundays. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, December 19th, 2021. These two hours are going by quickly. Man. Uh, <laughs> visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for the, uh, we have the course bundle pack. You can register for uh, both of the 10-week online classes I teach on the weekends. And uh, they make great gifts also. You can use these with your children, okay? I don't do a lot of cursing. It's not crazy. Uh, I would say the content is PG-13. 
On Saturdays, we do from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. We do that 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Sundays, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. So we do the sessions live, but all of them are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. You can watch them around the world. So you don't have to be present in class. I'm not going to take attendance, anything like that. And then also you can see me. I can't see you. So it's not like a, a Zoom call for work or anything like that. Right. Um, it, we'll post a link here. As soon as you register, you can uh, watch the class we did yesterday. And for understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, we're doing a special class on Tuesday, uh, December 21st, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you can join us in class live for that. All right. Uh, let me get I want to get back to uh, Reverend Raphael Warnock. Now, this was from Wednesday, December 15th on the Senate floor. And he's talking about the hypocrisy of not being able to raise the uh not being able, able to get around the filibuster when it comes to voting rights, but you can do it to raise the debt limit. Let's go back to the clip, Jalen. I will be honest. This has been a difficult week for me as I pondered how am I going to vote on this debt ceiling question we're about to take. I feel like I'm being asked to take a road that is a point of moral dissonance for me. Because while I deeply believe that both our democracy and our economy are important, I believe that it is misplaced to change the Senate rules only for the benefit of the economy when the warning lights on our democracy are flashing at the same time. Madam President, in light of the conniving methods of voter suppression we have seen enacted into law since the January 6th attack on the Capitol, I come to the floor today to share with the people of Georgia and the American people the message that I shared with my colleagues over the weekend and earlier today during our caucus meeting. I said to my Democratic colleagues, over the last several days. Number one, unfortunately, the vast majority of our Republican friends have made it clear that they have no intention of trying to work with us to address voter suppression or to protect voting rights. While we cannot let our Republican friends off the hook for not being equitable governing partners, if we are serious about protecting the right to vote that's under assault right now, Here's the truth. It will fall to Democrats to do it. And if Democrats alone must raise the debt ceiling, then Democrats alone must raise and repair the ceiling of our democracy. How do we in good conscience justify doing one and not the other? Some of my Democratic colleagues are saying, but what about what about bipartisanship? Isn't that important? I say, of course it is. But here's the thing we must remember. Slavery was bipartisan. Jim Crow segregation was bipartisan. The refusal of women's suffrage was bipartisan. The denial of the basic dignity of members of the LGBTQ community has long been bipartisan. The three-fifths compromise was the creation of a putative national unity at the expense of black people's basic humanity. So when colleagues in this chamber talk to me about bipartisanship, which I believe in, I just have to ask at whose expense? Mm -hmm. Who is being asked to foot the bill for this bipartisanship? And is liberty itself the cost? I submit that that's a price too high and a bridge too far. To my Democratic colleagues, I say while it is deeply unfortunate, it is more than apparent that it has been left to us 
to handle alone the task of safeguarding our democracy. The judgment of history is upon us. Future generations will ask, when the democracy was in a 911 state of emergency, what did you do to put the fire out? Did we rise to the moment or did we hide behind procedural rules? I believe that we Democrats can figure out how to get this done, even if that requires a change in the rules, which we established just last week that we can do when the issue is important enough. Well, the people of Georgia and across the country are saying that voting rights are important enough. I think the voting rights are important enough. Once we handle the debt ceiling, the Senate needs to make voting rights the very next issue we take up. We must do voting rights and we must deal with this issue now. Okay, so we got clip four. Jalen, uh, it's like two minutes. Uh, Rachel Maddow spoke with Raphael Warnock. You got that queued up? You got it queued yes. up? Okay, let's go. Let's go to that one quickly. Senator, you said in your remarks today that you have spoken with your Democratic colleagues about this. And that point that you were making, that Republicans have plighted their troth on this, and they shouldn't be let off the hook for that. They should be held to account for it. But when it comes to acting, it's never been more clear that it must be Democrats who act. Now that there have been these two exceptions made in the past couple of weeks on the filibuster rule, now, frankly, that the January 6th investigation has revealed so much terrible backstory in terms of how serious the plot was to overthrow the election and to pervert the administration of the election in 2020. Um, do you sh do you sense any, any movement, any shift among your Democratic colleagues to your way of thinking on this? We've been having some encouraging conversations. I've been talking to many of my colleagues, including Senator Manchin, and I've been talking to Leader Schumer, uh, others throughout the weekend. And uh, I'm going to continue to make the case because, again, I think this is the most important thing we can do this Congress. We make a terrible era of judgment if we behave as if these are ordinary times. Mm -hmm. OK, pause, pause right there. All right. We'll continue all this uh, on Monday's show. Uh, some of this we dealt with this past week. We saw the Senator John Hickenlooper of Colorado, as well as Senator uh, uh, Hassan, uh, Maggie Hassan of New Hampshire, who were against changing the filibuster. They're Democrats. They're saying now after the two meetings that took place this week on Wednesday and Thursday, they're saying now we have to change the filibuster. Um, those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching for a few more minutes. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Right now, it's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And so we have to intensify the pressure. Tomorrow, we'll talk about the pressure that needs to be put on corporations as well. It is much more I had to get to information I have. We ran out of time here. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We'll count it forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace. Okay, stand by, stand by. Okay. So we'll continue this on Monday's show. Some of this we dealt with on Wednesday and Thursday. If you missed the shows from uh, Wednesday, uh, December 15th and Thursday, December 16th. Go back and watch those. I'm going to share the segment from Roland Martin Unfiltered where we uh, dealt with the Voting Rights Act because we talked about that Friday as well. And one thing that I brought up was, and I've said this before, and I said this months ago, and um, people keep missing this. There were 150 companies who uh july 14th 2021 uh we talked about this article here because we deal with real topics not this bs that a lot of people want to get preoccupied with because they don't have like substance to deal with um and don't do research this one right here you remember we talked about this 
This came out July 14th, 2021. More than 150 companies back update to Voting Rights Act. More than 150 companies back update to Voting Rights Act. Now, this is something that, something I've been saying for months because if you look quickly here, then I have to get out of here. Everybody go read this article. July 14th, 2021. Okay, I know I know the date because I've got the article here. But I, I print out like thousands of articles. So I have the articles here. I got all this stuff. And what I've been saying is that I'm seeing that a lot of the I'm seeing a lot of marching and mass protest, but people are not talking about putting economic pressure on corporations. Because a lot of these corporations finance the Republicans that are blocking the voter rights bill. And it's going to come to an ultimatum. Either you tell these Republicans to stop blocking the voting rights bill, or you're going to withdraw economic support from them, or we're going to withdraw economic support from you. Because it doesn't make sense for us to keep financing our own dehumanization. Especially when they came out and said they support the Voting Rights Act. More than 150 companies back update to Voting Rights Act. Major businesses like PepsiCo, Macy's, Ikea, and Nestle USA signed on to a letter supporting the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Now, we know the only that now the John Lewis Voting Rights Act passed in the House of Representatives in August of 2021 by a vote of 219 to 211. Go to congress.gov, you to congress.gov, you can track all these bills. And you can see what the vote was. You can see who voted for it. All the Republicans voted against the bill. All, all the Republicans voted against the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. And the, on tomorrow's show, what we're going to talk, talk about is what one of the things we'll talk about on Monday's show is um Martin Luther King III. He's saying, look, one. Don't celebrate Dr. King's birthday if you want the obstruction is voting the vote of blocking the Voting Rights Act, number one. Number two, he's saying the focus for Dr. King's birthday needs to be put in pressure to get the Voting Rights Act passed. In any, any of these people who have been blocking the Voting Rights Act, then they want to put out a tweet or something or a statement on Dr. King Day they need to have holy hell to pay. There needs to be a, a, a massive backlash against that. And any of them who show up to like Dr. King Day celebration, they've been blocking the Voting Rights Act or voted against the Voting Rights Act if they're in the House of Representatives. The Voting Rights Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act passed the House of Representatives in, in August of 2021. But you had 211 traders Republicans that voted against it. Don't bring your ass to the Dr. King Day celebration and you voted against the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Oh, hell no. They, 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 they need to be blasted until they leave. They need to be exposed. Right there on stage to be exposed. How the hell you bring your ass up here for Dr. King Day and you are dismantling his legacy? And they need to be held accountable for that. But also we have to go after these corporations. This is something I've been saying because oftentimes when these conversations take place, and, and, I, and I listen to people from NAACP and Urban League and things like this, loving the life, but they're not talking about putting economic pressure on these corporations. Who now it'd be different. I, I'm talking about the corporations who came out in support of the voting rights bill. And then remember, Major League Baseball took the uh all star game out of Atlanta because Georgia passed the voter suppression bill. You have these periods of, periods of time where you have corporations that are jump out and say the right thing, just like doing a protest in, in summer 2020 around George Floyd, and some of them made pledges and things like this, some money, things like this, haven't followed through. Now, some have followed through on the money, some haven't followed through on the money. I'm saying we have to hold all these people accountable. So 
if you look at this article quickly, more than 150 companies, including PepsiCo, Amazon, Target, and Target, threw their support behind updating the Voting Rights Act in a letter Wednesday in July 2021, a few months ago. The signatories, all U.S. employer, the, the signatories, all U.S. employers urged Congress to enact the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act legislation that will restore a key provision of the 1965 law that was stripped out by the U.S. Supreme Court case of Shelby County versus Holder in 2013 that gutted Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act that deals with the preclearance and the oversight, the federal oversight from a federal judge. Now, the bill would again require jurisdictions with a history of discrimination to get permission from the Department of Justice to make changes to their elections using an updated formula to determine those jurisdictions. Okay? This is restoring the 65 Voting Rights Act. The reason why you needed a 1965 Voting Rights Act is because of what happened at the Mississippi State Convention in 1890. At the Mississippi State Convention in 1890, they rewrote the state constitution to impose poll taxes and literacy tests to suppress the African-American vote. And at the time, African-Americans were the majority of voters in the state of Mississippi. This is why you needed a 65 Voting Rights Act. This became known as the Mississippi Plan, what they did. This became known as the Mississippi plan. They instituted poll taxes and literacy tests. The white county judge that presided over the, 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 the state convention, his name was Solomon Saladin Calhoun. And this is what he said. He said, quote, let the truth, he said, let's tell the truth if it bursts the bottom of the universe. He said, we came here to exclude the Negro. This is why they had the convention to rewrite the state constitution, to impose poll taxes, taxes and literacy tests, to suppress the African-American vote. We were in the state legislatures. We held a lot of positions in the state of Mississippi. Delegates eventually adopted a literacy test and poll tax gear to suppress the black vote in a state with a black majority. The Mississippi plan became the model throughout the South, part of a raft a racially oppressive Jim Crow laws that ended Reconstruction. Reconstruction ends in 1877. This became what what Mississippi did became the model for what other the the model that other Southern states copied. And then in 1898, you have the grandfather clause created in Louisiana, and Louisiana writes rewrites their state constitution. So this becomes copy what Mississippi did becomes copied by South Carolina, 1895, Louisiana, 1898. You have uh, Alabama, 1901. Uh, you have North Carolina around 1900. You had Georgia, 1908, Oklahoma, uh, about 1910. This is why you had to have a 65 Voting Rights Act to counter and wipe out and nullify what happened in Mississippi 75 years before that. If you read this piece here from the uh, Zen Education Project and see a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past and the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. This is why it's uh, this is why it's important to understand history and understand politics. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power and resources and the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties, the adoption, interpretation and enforcement. Historical events don't take place in a vacuum. They have a culmination of a sequence of historical events. Now, December 16th, and we talked about this on my show Thursday, December 16th was the birthday of Jimmy Lee Jackson. Jimmy Lee Jackson, his, 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 Jimmy Lee Jackson being shot and killed by an Alabama State Trooper in February 1965 was part of the inspiration of the, of the 54 mile Selma to Montgomery march where you have Bloody Sunday, March 7, 1965. 
Read this piece here from the Zen Education Project, November 1st, 1890, Mississippi Constitution. They adopted the, the new Mississippi State Constitution that instituted poll taxes and arbitrary literacy tests designed to disenfranchise newly enfranchised African Americans. They, they adopted that November 1st, 1890. It took 75 years to get a Federal Voting Rights Act in 1965. So, and, and if you look at this here, you'll see that this was copied by the other Southern states, North Carolina, 1900, Alabama, 1901, Louisiana, 1898, Virginia, 1901, Georgia, 1908, Oklahoma, 1910. Okay. So read this here from the Zen Education Project. We talked about this before. So. Uh, let's see here. We've got this one here with the corporations. So the bill again, the bill would again require jurisdictions with a history of discrimination like Georgia, Texas, Louisiana, uh, Alabama to get permit like these former Confederate states to get permission from the Department of Justice to make changes to their elections using an updated formula to determine those jurisdictions. The letter made no mention of Republican efforts to tighten voting right, the voting rules across the country after uh, former Benedict Donald, traitor in chief, uh, after his election loss, and they're pushing the big lie, okay, and crafting these voter restriction bills but they're using a template to craft these voter restriction bills so just as the mississippi plan became the plan used throughout the south by other southern states well mother jones exposed jessica anderson of the of the heritage project and this deals with um Pull this up here. This deals with video, leak video, dark money group, leaked video, dark money group brags about writing GOP voter suppression bills across the country. So what we found out in May of 2021 was that because we many of us were sitting back. And trying to figure out well, wait a second how is it these state legislators republicans and state legislatures are coming up with these voter restriction bills so quickly and one after the other in in these state legislatures how, how are they doing this so quickly it's a coordinated effort leaked video dark money group brags about writing gop voter suppression bills across the country we did it quickly and we did it quietly said executive director of, of heritage action which is a sister organization to the heritage foundation jessica anderson said this so this was exposed in may of 2021 by ari berman for mother jones we talked about this here on this we did like with real stuff in a private meeting last month which would be may or which would be april 2021 with big donors the head of a top conservative group boasted that her outfit had crafted had crafted the new voter suppression law in Georgia and was doing the same with similar bills for Republican state legislators across the country. So just as the Mississippi plan got copied by other southern states, here you have this on steroids here. Quote, in some cases, we actually draft them for them because they're dumb as hell. That's why. So in some cases, the Heritage Action Organization, this right wing organization that is a sister organization to the Heritage Foundation. In some cases, they draft these boilerplate voter suppression bills for these dumbass Republicans in the state legislatures. She said, or. 
we have a sentinel on our behalf, give them the model legislation so it has that grassroots from the bottom up type of vibe. You know, that old good old white supremacist, you know, good old boy type of vibe. They may even have some misspelled words in there just to make it look like a dumbass wrote it. The Georgia law had, quote, eight key provisions that Heritage Act recommended. Jessica Anderson, the executive director for Heritage Action for America, a sister organization to the Heritage Foundation, told the foundation's donors at an April 22nd, 2021 gathering in Tucson, Arizona, in a recording obtained by the watchdog group documented and shared with Mother Jones, the news publication Mother Jones. Those eight items included policies severely restricting mail ballot drop boxes, preventing election officials from sending absentee ballot request forms to voters, making it easier for partisan workers to monitor the polls, preventing the collection of mail ballots and restricting the ability of counties to accept donations from nonprofit groups seeking to aid in election and seeking to aid in election administration. Okay. Read, read the rest of this here. I'm, I'm out of time. I don't have time to go through the rest of this. Okay. Read this article here. This is from May 13th, 2021. So I was months ago, I was saying, well, wait a second. We need to look at leveraging our economics to enforce our politics and put economic pressure on these corporations because they came out in support of the Voting Rights Act, but then they disappeared. Now, either, either these 150, either these 150 businesses all went out of business and I ain't know about it, or they have amnesia or they lied. Either they went out of business and I ain't know about it. And I study this stuff like every day. So I think I know if Amazon went out of business. I don't think they went out of business. I don't think Pepsi went out of business. Either these 150 companies went out of business and nobody told me. Or they have amnesia. Or they lied or were not like 100% committed. So th this is what I've been saying. It's like, look, the marching has its purpose. But people ain't scared of marching. When you when you start putting economic pressure on these corporations, because once again, if we go back to 2015 in the state of Indiana, and I've said this here on this show, I've said this on Roller Martin Unfiltered. If you go back to 2015 in the state of Indiana, when you had the Indiana transgender bathroom bill, corporations came out in droves condemning the bill. And they threatened, they threatened to withdraw economic support from the state of Indiana. They threatened to cancel conferences, okay? Within about a week, the state legislature in Indiana rewrote the bill. There was even one conference that actually canceled. I think it was a gaming conference or something like that, like video games, something like that. They came under intense pressure. Yes, corporations spoke out some months ago. But the type of pressure they put on Indiana is not the type of pressure that we saw them exhibit here. This is what I said before. I said, if you stand up for LGBTQ, then you need to stand up for BLACK also. OK, because we spend money with these corporations as well, and we shouldn't keep financing our own dehumanization. So. Re re read this here, we'll talk about this some more tomorrow. But with, with with these various our various organizations, we have to we have to call these corporations out because you came out in support of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act when back in July, but you've gone silent now. All right, we have to get out of here. Okay. Um, also, if you like this type of type of information, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. 
uh this is our official cash app account here when you go to it, it says michael shows my picture there dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w these other ones here are fake african history network uh cash app accounts so don't donate to don't support those and think you send it to us all right we have to get out of here uh remember right now is correct wrong behavior it's not over till we win we'll count it forever we'll talk to you tomorrow peace